Um, uh, so, uh, Yifat, um, uh, I am chairing this uh, seminar and it's very unfortunate we have to do this uh, online. I think we wanted to do this um, originally in um, November, but then we had lockdown and uh, Yifat couldn't come. But it's still great that you can present your um, work here. And I think it's very nice, or it ties to many topics also people from the center uh, or are interested in working on. So I think, I hope this is still a great opportunity to exchange views. I know Yifat from, uh, summer schools, actually. Um, that's the first time we met. Uh, you were then writing your PhD with Hanok Dagan. And, uh, well, we have always had lovely exchanges about law and politics and about everything else. Uh, so it's awesome to, to have you here. Uh, later on, you have also done um, a fellowship um, or a postdoc at the Safra Center. Um, uh, for ethics at Tel Aviv University. And it's interesting to see how the centers have actually um, uh, many people who came from Safra went to ACT and vice versa. So it's a grace to see how the centers really have um, worked together. And I think there has been great cross fertilization, if that's a term in English, I have no idea. Um, so uh, Yifat is mainly interested in um, uh, in fiduciary law, and um, I think this is a topic which is slightly um, foreign perhaps to most people in civil law, and this uh, article, and you perhaps can introduce much better yourself, Yifat, um, goes really to the heart of this, is actually um, where the similarities might be in civil law jurisdictions and common law jurisdictions. So. Um, uh, I give the floor uh, to you without further ado. Um, Yifat, please present your um, uh, paper. It was a pleasure to read. And afterwards I can uh, collect, uh, I will collect uh, questions for you and we can um, further discuss. So good, floor to you. <clears throat> so thank you very much, Mirta. And thank you uh, for having me here, both to Professor Martel and to Lindsay for all the work that she's done to make sure that I can come to Amsterdam personally, which in the end uh, I couldn't uh, again due to COVID. Um, so I'm very sorry about that, but uh, considering the situation in Europe right now, I think we are lucky that we can actually have a Zoom discussion. So that's, that's better than uh, nothing comparing to what's going on in other places. So uh, I'm happy for that. Um, and as for the presentation, I wanna really divide it into uh, three parts. So I want to start with presenting uh, the aims of the article, that is the background to the project and why I thought the question that I tried to answer in the article is an interesting one. Uh, I then want to move uh, to present uh, shortly, the, shortly the main arguments of the project. Uh, and I'm not sure how many of you had a chance to had a look at the paper itself. So I'll try to summarize it and to sort of uh, highlight what I think are uh, maybe the difficulties or the concerns I have uh, about the current draft. Uh, and finally, the last part of the presentation, I wanna uh, ask what's next. So that is where I think this project can uh, move forward, what I think uh, could be the, the future of uh, the discussion it raised. So, um, Starting uh, with the aims of the project, uh, as Mirka said, we first met in Amsterdam uh, more than two years ago, actually. Uh, and I think uh, it's really a pleasure to present this project in Amsterdam because it's also uh, the place where I first thought about this project. So sort of from the discussions and from the conversation we had in Amsterdam, it started. So it's a kind of a closure to now present, present the idea uh, here. Uh, and really what came to my mind when I was uh, in Amsterdam was sort of the question of why doesn't the civilian uh, jurisdiction don't have uh, the concept of uh, fiduciary law. And the classic cases uh, from which this legal institution uh, grew is the relationship between a, a trustee and a beneficiary, uh, which are regulated under uh, the law of trust. And Trust law really regulates cases of uh, what we call in the common law equitable ownership. So that is a uh, circumstances where the owner of the property uh, gives it to another, the trustee, 
uh, who must keep the property and use it uh, solely for the benefit of the other. Uh, but when the literature speaks about fiduciary law or fiduciary relationship, uh, it refers not only to this uh, classical example of trust law, but many other relationships, such as the relationship between uh, officers and the company, lawyers and clients, uh, guardianship, agency, financial advisors, uh, advisors and, and many others. Uh, according to some countries, also doctors are considered fiduciary uh, and also even parents uh, to their children. So all these relationships are subject to uh, the duty of loyalty. Uh, and fiduciary law is the general term that describes uh, these relationships. Uh, and of course, it is clear that the problems that are governed under fiduciary law are not unique to the common law. So all these relationships exist also in the civilian countries. And, and clearly, if you don't have such a legal uh, concept, it's fair to assume that uh, there are alternative legal mechanism that will uh, regulate this situation. Uh, however, very little literature was dedicated to explore uh, these issues. And most of the writing that I could find uh, concentrated on trust law, so not on the general concept, other re uh, fiduciary relationships. Uh, and it also uh, concentrated on a, a functional uh, perspective so that is examining what legal tools uh, were developed in civilian countries as an alternative to the idea of equitable ownership over property. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, this writing didn't examine how uh, con contractual regulation of this relationship in civilian countries can explain uh, why this concept is absent from uh, continental jurisdictions. Uh, and the more I was explored also during the conversation I had in Amsterdam to the fact that uh, contract law in the continent is very different than the way uh, common law thinks about contract law, uh, I became convinced that this is a possible explanation to this uh, difference between the uh, two systems. And uh, very few writers did write about this subject and they also supported this uh, assumption. But um, the main difficulty I found was how am I going to examine this question? So how can, from a, me a methodological point of view, how can I show that uh, there is a connection between the way common law, uh, sorry, civil law regulates contractual relationships and the way common law regulates fiduciary relationships? Uh, and one possible way was to choose a, a certain kind of relationship. So let's say uh, lawyers and clients and to see how the regulation uh, in the common law uh, regulate this relationship and try to locate it. what rules uh, regulate the same relationship in the civilian countries. But if I would have done that for each and every kind of fiduciary relationship, uh, I would need to write a book and uh, not an article. A and such a project would also be extremely complicated because each of these relationships also under common law is regulated by more than the duty of loyalty. So what I chose to do instead was to concentrate on two specific duties, the fiduciary duty of loyalty in the common law and the uh, contractual duty of good faith in the civil law and to compare between them. And supposedly this is a simple move. So I take a review of two legal obligations and I compare between them. Uh, but of course, this is not so simple uh, due to the fact that both of these obligations are what we call legal standards uh, rather than legal rules. So this means that by their nature, they are a flexible legal concept and both regarding loyalty and good faith, as far as uh, I understood it correctly, uh, you can't find their content in a one legal document, uh, and it is not clearly and precisely determined in advance, but rather it is shaped by the case law and the reality of life. Uh, and this means that if I concentrate only on a functional or practical level of each duty, uh, it will not be enough, I will miss some of the 
content. And the comparison has to include some theoretical level, that is what each duty aims to achieve. And so to perform this uh, comparison, I had to find what is the meaning of uh, good faith in civilian uh, jurisdiction? What purposes uh, the different rules that, that are based on a good faith, in fact, uh, try to achieve? And the solution I found for uh, using this purpose was uh, to use a secondary resource, which is the draft common frame of reference, the DCFR. Uh, as I explained in the article, and since I'm, I'm guessing most of you are familiar with this document, I won't say a lot about it. Uh, it's a document that was written by experts recruited from different countries in the European Union, founded by the European Commission. Uh, and as a secondary source, meaning it's not an actual law of any country, it clearly has some uh, limitation as a basis for research mostly because I can't look at this document and say it actually represents an actual law of any civilian jurisdiction. But I think for my purposes, uh, the document still has uh, two main advantages and I hope that I could convince you uh, in that uh, argument. So first, the main advantages it has over uh, looking at the rules or specific regulation is that it consolidates various aspects of good faith in one document. And I think that given the complexity of this legal concept, this is a, a significant advantage because it allows me to present a, a description of the role good faith plays in civilian contract law. And if I would have tried to compare a specific civilian legal system like Germany or France with a, a common law system like England, I think uh, this advantage of having one document where you can find uh, various aspects of uh, good faith, it would have been uh, lost. And I think the second advantage uh, the DCFR offers uh, in comparing to other ways of dealing with this question is that it provide an easy access to legal rules uh, that are relevant to uh, different European countries. So it therefore allows me to examine uh, the legal tradition of continental Europe from what I call a bird's eye view. So when I look at the law from this perspective, uh, this macro picture, uh, it means that necessarily I would lose some details. So there will be some inaccuracy regarding what is the actual law that applies in a specific uh, micro level jurisdiction. But I think that still there is much to be learned from such an exercise, despite the clear limitation it has. And while some details will necessarily be lost when you look at the law from a distance or from above, it also means that you will see things that if you look very closely from the ground, uh, you will also meet. So a picture painted from above will necessarily include some new information uh, that someone that is looking only on the details on the ground will not be able to see. Uh, and I think this is a, a worthwhile exercise because of that advantages. So I wanna use this quote uh, because I think it can explain uh, the goals of my exercise. And um, James Whitman said that comparative law could also be used to grasp dynamics of the law in ways that depart from familiar description. And I think um, this is what I try to achieve in this project. Uh, so while I won't be able to provide you with an accurate answer regarding the application of good faith in a particular context, in a particular jurisdiction, I think that uh, if you can grasp generally what these concepts mean and what are the similarities and differences between the duty of royalty and good faith uh, and how the, these differences uh, reflect on civilian thinking about contract law uh, more generally, generally, it is a worthwhile exercise.
So assuming uh, you now have the background and my motivation for the project, and assuming uh, at least some of you had the chance to look at the article itself, I will try to now briefly summarize uh, the main argument. And first I opened the article by presenting a, a short description of the common law uh, duty of loyalty. And as I explained there, the duty of loyalty uh, strives to minimize the opportunities of the fiduciary uh, for abusing the power given to him from his role and, and to ensure that the fiduciary uh, will not abuse uh, his role, the duty of loyalty sets a very strict standard. Uh, and that standard requires the fiduciary to act solely for the promotion of the best interest of the beneficiary. So the fiduciary must avoid any conflict of interest between his own self-interest and the performance of his duties. And this general idea of loyalty was developed over time to a set of more concrete application that I also review in the article. And as I mentioned there, the literature also emphasized the difference in the common law between fiduciary relationship and other uh, contractual relationship. And it emphasized the fact that in these cases, uh, considering the power gaps between the parties and the information gaps between them, it is necessary to set a more normative message to the fiduciary that will reduce the temptation he will have uh, from exploiting the power he has for the promotion of uh, his own self-interest. And after this uh, introduction to the duty of loyalty, what I do in the second part is I use the DCFR to present the content and the meaning of the duty of good faith. And as the DCFR uh, presented, the good faith is really about honesty and openness. It's, uh, it could prevent behavior that is unlawful, dishonest, or unreasonable. It has an important role in increasing contractual security because the parties will know that they are expected uh, to act according to good faith. And it also has an important role in promoting justice since the parties will know that they cannot rely on a behavior that contradicts good faith. Uh, and before I move forward to saying a, a bit more about how I understand this uh, legal standard, I wanted to say something about the question of balance. Uh, and as I said, my starting point was asking uh, why is fiduciary law not found in civilian jurisdictions? Uh, and accordingly, my main interest was to try and understand uh, what is the meaning of uh, the civilian good faith. Uh, that means, however, that a much smaller part in the article was dedicated to discussing the meaning of loyalty, which is also a very complicated duty that there are a lot of writing and arguments about what exactly does this duty mean. Uh, and that leads me to the next question or slide, which is um, who is really the audience of this article? So um, I think it's currently written more to um, fiduciary law experts, so people who read and know a lot about fiduciary law and are not interested in reading more about loyalty, but they will be interested in learning more about good faith and how it might reflect on their understanding of loyalty. And that explains the current balance in the article, but I'm not 100% sure that indeed this is what I wanna achieve. And therefore, it was also very important for me to present it to um, civil law audience and to hear your thoughts also on that point. So whether you found uh, the balance uh, in the article uh, fitting and whether you felt there is too much information about good faith in the article, this is actually not really necessary for uh, the argument uh, it makes. So that was a pause of sort of a one difficulty I still have uh, with the current uh, draft. Uh, and I'll go back to uh, the main argument. So as I said, um, the second part of the article focused on how good faith is understood by the DCFR. 
And what I did is I tried to divide uh, the usages of good faith into four categories based on, on what I found was the main purpose, uh, the rule that appeared in the DCFR was performing. And of course, it's fair to say that a certain rule might fit more than one category, but I think the division is still uh, useful and it might help to understand better for someone who is not familiar with uh, European good faith, uh, what is the content of this uh, duty? So the first category was uh, what I called uh, good, the use of good faith in solving information gaps. And here I include, for example, uh, disclosure duties. So uh, things that contractual parties need to uh, disclose to each other. Uh, the second category, is uh, preventing exploitation. So for example, uh, the rule says that an SAE of a contract could not take advantage of an apparent meaning of a term if the parties agreed otherwise. So I think this rule aims at preventing uh, exploitation between contractual parties. Uh, the third category is uh, minimizing unfairness. So for example, uh, if a term is supplied by one party but it significantly uh, disadvantaged the other party, it could be considered against a good faith to enforce such a term. So for me here, the rule, the role of the good faith is to minimize unfairness. Uh, and finally, the fourth category, uh, I include what I call encouraging uh, decent conduct. And for example, the duties of the parties to cooperate so uh, here I think good faith uh, plays uh, an important role in sending a message to the party about what is the proper role for their behavior. Uh, and of course, it is clear that this is not a clear cut. So the line between minimizing unfairness and encouraging different uh, contacts might be blurred in some cases. Uh, but I, as I try to explain in the article, I think that um, there is an internal uh, sense in each of the categories, and I would be very happy to hear your thought if you thought that uh, one of the categories doesn't make sense to you. Uh, I would be happy to hear any thoughts you had about this uh, point. And moreover, I would also uh, be happy to hear going back to the uh, bird eye view uh, on the law, uh, I would be very happy to hear if any of you recognize any of the Dutch law in this description of the DCFR. So whether uh, this view actually represents how you understand the way uh, good faith operates inside your own system, or is it really uh, very remote? So it's sort of just to know uh, how well is this process uh, working uh, in reality. And so, Based on these uh, two descriptions, so I had the duty of uh, loyalty in the first part and the duty of good faith in the second part, I asked in the third part of the article, is it the case of apple and oranges? So are those two legal uh, duties simply too distinct to be uh, discussed together? Uh, and as you know, my conclusion is no. Uh, and accordingly, in the third part, I try to demonstrate uh, regarding each of the main usages of good faith, uh, what is the similarities between the role loyalty plays in the common law and this usage of good faith? Uh, and I hope I uh, managed to convince those of you who read that despite uh, the clear differences, uh, both duties do fulfill similar goals, even if uh, the scale and context they perform this role uh, might uh, change. Uh, and that is with the exception of the third usage, which is uh, unfairness, since I clarified that the duty of loyalty uh, does not directly deal with question of unfairness uh, in contractual relationship. So, Hopefully this uh, comparison uh, was somewhat uh, convincing or at least interesting. Uh, and that leads me to uh, the question, uh, what does it mean? Why do we care about it? Uh, and this is really the last part of the article. And the main 
argument I try to make here is relying on these comparisons is that even if uh, we take the civilian way of thinking about contract law, which is much wider than the common law thinking about contract law, and we accept that good faith helps to regulate some of the problems that are governed under fiduciary law, uh, there is still much value uh, in thinking about certain uh, relationship under a different legal category and applying different legal concepts to these uh, relationships. And this is what I call in the article, and that's where the article gets its title, a reimagining of a civilian contract. And I think once we understand that uh, we have two legal concepts that aim at achieving a very similar goal, uh, yet one of them is a general uh, duty that applies to all contracts, and one of them is a specific duty that applies only to certain uh, relationships. And that immediately calls for thinking about how this structure of thinking generally about all contracts and thinking specifically about certain contracts affects the outcome of the legal rules that will be developed. And I think the project so far as I presented it is mainly descriptive, but there is a very important normative conclusion to be drawn from this description. And that conclusion that I try to push forward is that when thinking about all contracts under the same categories, some of the unique aspects of fiduciary law which requires, as I said in the beginning of this uh, talk, forsaking one's own self-interest. So not only cooperation and not only working together, but really forsaking one's self-interest uh, might be missed. And if you're not convinced, I would be happy to hear why. And finally, uh, the last three minutes of my talk, I will dedicate to asking uh, what's next. So as I said, I think this is mainly a descriptive uh, project and I think it's mainly a start of the discussion. It's not an end, uh, mainly when you consider that I've taken uh, this bird eye view, which can't really tell us enough about what is the actual law in civilian countries. So I think there are many more questions that could be asked and uh, from a civilian perspective I think that uh, the interesting questions could be for example which are the relationships that deserve such uh, a different treatment that is not under uh, general uh, good faith they, are, they they're not necessarily have to be the same relationship that are governed under fiduciary law in the common law uh, what are the appropriate remedies in these cases so should the count of profit be um, given more generously in these cases? What is the technical way uh, in which more extensive duties could be imposed in this situation? Uh, assuming we accept that if we use the same term of good faith to all contracts, we might not reach uh, the results we hope to reach. Uh, but finally, I think, as I explained in the summary, this discussion also uh, raises additional questions from the perspective of the common law. Uh, and that is really, uh, do contractual relationships really aim to serve one's own self-interest? So I think once we see how contract law and fiduciary law are actually closer than we think from looking at civilian countries, we can ask is the gap we have in the common law where contract law are uh, a tool to promote your own self-interest, but on fiduciary law, you have to deserve to desert your own self-interest and to act only for the interest of the other. Uh, this gap is, is not easily understood. And therefore I think that I wanna conclude the article also in thinking that also in the common law more um, room should be given for seeing contract as a tool for cooperation rather than uh, competition. And with that, I will conclude my talk. I think I managed to keep the 25 minutes I promised. And thank you very much. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions.